Um, with that, I can say that it's my great, uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, today's uh, speaker, Ines Cipolito, here in our CCNB seminar series at the Free University uh, in Berlin, where we have in this semester as the topic of the seminar series, uh, like the uh, tutorials on the free energy principle and predictive coding. And um, some, what was it, half a year ago, uh, Ines Hippolyte was also organizing here a big workshop that probably many people have attended uh, on the free energy principle here in Berlin over the Berlin School of Mind and Brain. Uh, so Ines um, is affiliated to the uh, UCL in London. Uh, she is also a fellow at the Developmental Psychology at the Faculty of the Behavioral Science uh, Faculty at the University of Amsterdam and is here in Berlin as lecturer at the Mind and Brain School, um, which belongs uh, to Humboldt University and is dealing in her work, uh, as I understand it, mostly with free energy principle uh, uh, in the context of interpreting the mind's function. We had multiple uh, talks here in this series before. Uh, which were uh, introducing mostly technical aspects of uh, free energy principle and computations within that. Um, we are very much looking forward uh, to a, uh, your talk today. And uh, with this, I think I uh, directly hand over. Nice to have you. Thank you so much, Timo, and thank you so much for uh, inviting me, um, joining uh, this uh, wonderful um, speakers that uh, you've been having in this uh, really uh, great initiative uh, group on the free energy principle in um, in uh, Berlin. Um, thanks um, so much for the very kind introduction. I am going to now try to share my slides. Hopefully uh, there won't be anything grant access in systems preferences. Yes, I think that's fine. Yeah, so the title of my talk is The Free Energy Principle on the Edge of Chaos. I would like to just preface it uh, by saying that um, that uh, it is a little bit of a talk on um, the cognitive, uh, sorry, on the, the philosophy of science of the free energy principle. And that's sort of like speaking to and relating to uh, the most recent uh, events um, on that have been happening on the last year. So if you could just give me the next slide. Perfect. So yeah, here we go. Um, there's been a little bit of a um, discussion uh, going on on the literature and the philosophy side. Um, where people are um, talking to each other about uh, this uh, realism, non-realism uh, kind of approach um, to the free energy principle. Of course, in philosophy, this is not um, news. Um, it is a very uh, live discussion in philosophy of science in general about theories, models, um, uh, etc. In, in science, in scientific practice. And more recently, this uh, debate has been revived in the light of the free energy principle. And that's what I wanted to talk about uh, today. So if you go to the next slide. Yeah, so um, the lineup for today is just these three main points. Uh, I will go very quickly over the realism debate. And then I will introduce just the essentials of the free energy principle, which, uh, of course, people that are uh, usual, usually coming to these um, to these seminars, of course, uh, they are very, very much acquainted. But I'm going to highlight the points that we need to highlight in order to then come back and think about the free energy principle in the light of the realism debate. OK, so um, next slide. Yes, so we go now to the realism debate and uh, Nobody would be happy with this uh, definition that I have here because uh, the realism debate is so nuanced, uh, philosophically speaking, that it will be it is very difficult to come up with a definition that will make everybody happy. But let's try. Um, so we can say about realism or try to define it as uh, the properties of a model are expected as somewhat an ontological property of the phenomenon of scientific interest. So you should find some kind of isomorphism, some kind of match between the properties of the model and the properties of uh, the phenomenon under study. The next slide. So, for example, the property of study is as uh, we are here uh, precisely to study all of that things that we love, the brain, cognition or even um, cell activity. Next slide. Yes, so basically now there are three or um, I was thinking about how, how can we uh, put this together? The literature is so vast 
and so integrated. I was thinking, okay, let's try to put together at least three main groups or three main ways that we can think of uh, the realism. So the first one is uh, the sort of like the more traditional one, which is thinking about under realism, thinking about models as accurate representations, right? And this comes, for example, from uh, Gottlob Frege in Sense and Reference. Next slide. Yeah, um, so the second one is um, a little bit more complex, uh, but it's sort of like what we have, um, we find a lot in uh, cognitive science or cognitive neuroscience, which is uh, the idea that if models are obstructions and if they succeed to predict, then the properties of the model should be literally present in the system being modeled. It was, was there a question? Oh, I thought I had um, a microphone. Okay, uh, so you find, for example, that in uh, particularly uh, very explicitly in uh, this paper by Michael Briscolra defending a realist perspective on Bayesian cognitive science. Next slide. The third way of being realist um, in scientific practice is to claim um, that claims made about the system of interest, of scientific interest, interest by truth preservation can also apply to the system itself, in which case a target system is held to the properties of the model. So this is found, for example, in um, these uh, two papers that I have here, which are very recent in the literature, on the free energy principle and active inference. So that would be one way to connect or think about models made under active inference of free energy principle uh, that also hold a realist perspective um, on, on the target system explained under the free energy or active inference. Next slide. Oh yeah, so then um, what happens is, to put it in a little bit more of a simpler way, is that the mappings between the model and the target, so the mappings between the model and the target, allow to convert truths found in the model into claims about the target system. So that's the very, very basic idea um, that is being held in the, this third uh, realist um, assumption. And then we have the converse or the counterpart, anti-realism. Uh, and roughly, the definition uh, goes something like this. The model is simply an instrumental tool that, once applied to some activity of in scientific interest, then the model allows to learn about and draw predictions about a system of scientific interest. So the main um, gist is that, as opposed to having an accurate match or isomorphism by virtue of this or that, um, way of thinking or arguing for it, um, the model is simply an instrumental tool that is an opportunity for learning. Next slide, I think. Oh, yeah. However, the system under study does not need to have the properties of the model, as, of course, it is uh, argued for uh, in the realist take on it, right? So that's why live debate going on. Next slide. Okay, so now also a, a couple of ways of uh, being anti-realist, right? So the first one is the meaningless way of thinking about models. Models are in themselves meaningless. Uh, they do not hold semantic value other than that that is constructed under or by using them to understand or predict behavior. And this was, uh, for example, held by uh, David Hilbert or um, Bas van Frassen. Next slide. Oh, yeah. Um, in their view, models need not to be more than empirically adequate uh, because they are mathematics, um, because mathematics is arithmetics and algebraic uh, qualifier free identities. So, in this sense, models themselves are semantic, um, uh, uh, they do not hold any semantic value and they are qualifier free. Yep, next slide. Okay, 
then uh, very much in agreement with um, with uh, David Hilbert and uh, Blas von Fassen is Albert Einstein in this amazing lecture that he gave in Berlin in 1921. If you hadn't had the opportunity to read it, please do so. Uh, and it tells us this was in Berlin and it tells us as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they are not certain. And as far as they're certain, they do not refer to the reality. It is certain that mathematics generally, and particularly geometry, owes its existence to the need which was felt of learning something about the relations of real things to one another. So, of course, this is very much in line with the anti-realism held by um, David Hilbert um, and Van Fassen. Next, and I think I have something, yeah, and this is actually something that if you are interested on, um, I've just uh, alluded to and the paper is just out, it's a commentary on um, Michael, uh, Miguel uh, Aguilera's uh, paper in Physics of Life Reviews, and we do uh, go on um, a little bit on that, Casper uh, Hesp and I. Okay, next slide. Then anti-realism take two is that there is found as uh, models thought of as idealizations or fictions uh, in science. And the idea is that models are uh, allow us to abstract certain features of a phenomenon and they are for that reason, by virtue of abstraction, an opportunity for learning. Next slide. Then take three on anti-realism uh, is the view that the success of a model justifies the acceptance of the epistemic value of the model without necessarily making ontological claims. So basically what we are saying is that um, the, the virtue of the model resides in its epistemic value and not in its ontological commitments or ontological commitments that one would make by virtue of using a model. Uh, I think there's more on that slide. Yeah. The success of our best scientific models, um, informed models, um, even if our model is extremely su successful, which of course we never know because nobody would ever uh, in, uh, claim that uh, they have a model that is true. Uh, in the best case scenario, we would claim that we have a model that is viable. So even if we have a very viable model, that does not, according to this uh, view and anti-realist uh, view, that does not allow us to um, hold um, a belief that everything in the model is true. So not even that, the model is viable. Okay, next slide. Oh yeah, so then we find these ideas, for example, as far back as Oziander in uh, his introduction to um, Copernico's uh, Magnus Opus, and he says something like this. The astronomer will take as their first choice that hypothesis, which is the easiest to grasp. The philosopher will perhaps rather seek the resemblance of the truth, but neither of them will understand or state anything certain unless it has been divinely revealed to them. Now, since one cannot in any way attain the true causes, one will adopt whatever suppositions enable the motions to be computed correctly. Okay, so this is take uh, three. Um, the models are, it's about the viability of the models rather than the truthiness of the models. Okay, so next slide. Oh yeah, so then um, one last thought on anti-realism um, take three is that then the hypotheses and assumptions that may or may not be encoded in a computational model are not intended to describe the way the object being modeled is actually structured, but next, simply serve to represent the observed data in an economical fashion. And this is quite interesting because these are thoughts that were pre present quite quite a while, far, a while back um, in time. Okay, next slide. So this was the setup uh, of course, he did not do any justice um, to the realism debate, which is absolutely rich, super nuanced, but at least you got an idea of like three takes of how to be realist about models um, or uh, three ways of being uh, non-realist or instrumentalist, if you will, about models. So now I want to say something about the FEP, just highlighting points that I find interesting in order to then come back to the realism debate and think about the FEP under that realism debate and see what we make of it.
Okay, so then next slide. All right, so I want to say here that I take um, typically I take my take on the FEP is um, so there are these two ways that you can get to the FEP. One is through the low road, which you start with Helmholtz um, and conscious machine, and then you work your way through Bayesian inference until you get to active inference until you get to um, FEP. My take, uh, or my preferable take, is uh, the high road, or what Carl is called the high road, which is where you start with um, biology and with certain observations that you make in the behaviour of the world, and then you put forward a sort of like a first premise um, about as an attempt to start explaining how systems, living systems, adaptive systems, behave in the world in a way that that first premise um, explains uh, throughout across the board um, adaptive behavior. So this is my preferred um, way, I think is the one that is most uh, plausible and most um, interesting to me. And it starts off with the question of how is it that living organisms persist while engaging in adaptive exchanges with the environment? And this is an extraordinary thing because and that's what I'm really obsessed about and I've, I really like is that it's so extraordinary that you have an, a, an environment that is constantly changing. So the only rule is uh, that things change um, and yet living systems do not succumb to those changes. They actually persist in this changing, continuously changing environment. And this is the thought that I find extremely important because we should not lose sight of that thought because once we do that will get, will get us into um, other parts that I find, at least I find less interesting, such as minds as computers. Okay, having said that, um, next slide. So this is living systems maintain themselves by, and then we continue, maybe you can just open the, yes, by remaining in non-equilibrium steady states, right? They are open systems, which is why, as we all know, they're non-equilibrium steady states, they're in S. Uh, next one. And they do that by restricting themselves to a limited uh, number of states. And why is that? Well, because uh, there is only a, a very a, a finite number of states that will uh, keep them alive and um, they will not um, atta attain a certain phase boundary that would uh, um, um, kill them or something like that. Okay, next one. Yeah. Okay, so then um, the FEP coming from this high road or described or explained from this high road, then um, the first thing to bear in mind is that it is a first principles in uh, statistical physics uh, understanding where organisms must maintain their existence. And this is what I was referring to earlier on as that first premise. So we look at the world, we look at uh, how living beings and adaptive systems behave in the environment, right? And there's one thing that is common to these systems is that they maintain their existence, right? And this is nice to have as a first premise because it's not um, controversial at all. I don't think that anybody would, um, would dispute this. Now, the um, second step of the FEP is that uh, how do they maintain their existence? How do they maintain this imperative? Well, by minimizing free energy, which can be seen or put forward or cast as a computational solution to the problem of explaining how the systems maintain their existence. Okay, next slide. So then active inference becomes super relevant here, as we know, because it is a theory of how living organisms maintain their existence. So how they comply with that imperative of remaining alive, maintaining their existence, they minimize surprise. How via uh, perception and action. Yeah, next slide. So then the fir first premise that we have when we start off our understanding from the FEP is that to survive, any living organism has to maintain itself in a suitable set of preferable or preferred states while avoid avoiding other these preferred states of the environment. But then here, another very philosophical question comes up for the philosophers in the room, which is, okay, but what are preferable states or preferable states for a certain system? How do we define them? How do they know, right? So a bunch of, uh, of, uh, of epistemological questions could come up, right? And uh, the FEP does reply to that. Um, next slide. Okay, so what are these preferred states, right? 
Okay, so preferred states are composed of two important aspects. So one is uh, those that are defined by niche specific evolutionary adaptations, um, which, for example, um, it would be very unlikely to uh, find, as we are doing our research, for example, to find a butterfly in, in a river. Right, because that would not be good for the butterfly. So those are niche specific evolutionary adaptations, even though there was once a student of mine who told me that some butterflies like to go in the water. So maybe this is not a good example. I should change this example. Okay, um, then the second uh, way of defining preferred states is a very important one, which is the learned cognitive goals. So as systems interact with the environment, of course, um, they uh, learn much more about the environment and themselves. And that would be the second way of setting or determining what would be a preferred state in order to maintain existence for an adaptive system. Okay, next one. So in order to survive, a fish for example, has to stay in a comfort zone that corresponds to a small subset of all the possible states in the universe. It has to stay in water, for example. Yeah, next. Similarly, a human has to ensure that the internal states, so for example, the physiological variables like body temperature and heart rate, remain within acceptable ranges, otherwise they will die. Um, so, um, or they will become a corpse. Next one. So then here I find this um, extremely um, interesting uh, for, um, for, for our perspective as human beings, because uh, if we do start with thinking, okay, human beings need to maintain their body temperature. So they need to do that by exerting active control, but then there are different ways that we can do that as opposed to non-human animals, right? So on the one hand, we can do and use all the physiology such as sweating, uh, but we can also um, use some cognitive mechanisms to buy a drink, for example. Uh, non-human animals could, for example, look for water. Um, or we can also have some cultural practices like, for example, turning on the air conditioning. Just some examples. Okay, so then um, the FEP or um, the free energy principle can be um, thought of as these sort of like steps where we can think about active inference as the biological problem of survival as surprise minimization, uh, where these surprising states are those that are outside the comfort zone of living organisms. So, for example, a surprising state for the butterfly would be water, and the surprising state for the fish would be being outside of water. Then the free energy principle, I'm sorry, then the free energy minimization comes very handy because it is a practical and biologically grounded way to explain how adaptive systems minimize surprise of these sensory encounters with the world. Okay, next slide. Then uh, we can, of course, as we all know, use active inference precisely uh, to explain this coupling uh, between a system that is adapting to a continuously changing environment where we can have uh, the system of interest as internal states and the system with which the, the and the surrounding environment of the system as external states where, as we all know, um, internal and external states uh, do not directly influence one another, but they are uh, indirectly influenced by blanket states such as sensory and um, active states. And the nice thing about it is that uh, we um, can uh, use the Markov blanket formalism that is scale free, which uh, interestingly allows us to um, set up the internal states of scientific interest um, for, for us. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so then this allows us, if we want, um, and note that I am doing literally the, the higher road uh, to the FEP, this allows us to now um, think about or bring into the conversation, if we want, the mechanistic predictive processing explanation, which uh, is derived from the FEP describing cognition as inference that aims to diminish 
free energy. So then what we have is uh, we have this mechanistic explanation of a process theory that allows us to explain uh, the activity in the brain um, in terms of this coupling between internal and external states uh, being mediated by um, uh, by blankets and uh, sorry by blanket states, um, meaning uh, uh, activity being explained by active inference which then uh, can be very much translated to the language of the Bayesian brain hypothesis. Okay, next slide. Yeah, which is uh, very, of course, uh, known uh, for us um, as top-down processes that encode predictions from priors and bottom-up processes that encode sensory observations such as prediction errors. So there's like two-way uh, uh, trafficking um, occurring uh, in brain activity and explaining how um, brain activity works. Okay, next one. Now, um, this was the sort of like the high road to the FEP and now I want to make like some more highlights, some uh, points that I find uh, quite relevant um, and interesting in in, in thinking about uh, things or behavior within the FEP uh, framework or by putting in the FEP uh, glasses. So one, even when we do the whole um, top-down approach um, or the high road approach to FEP where we start with um, that a very, very simple observation that uh, living beings, adaptive systems, they want to maintain their existence, right? Even when we start with that, and then we find the FEP and active inference as a way of explaining how they do that. And then we arrive at um, active inference and uh, can translate all the active inference formalism through uh, to predictive coding and explain how things work um, in the brain, for example. Um, it is important to note that even when we do all of that trajectory, um, inference is not necessarily accurate. So the optimality of all these mathematics and formalisms is subjective in the sense that organisms operate on the basis of a subject's um, or a subjective uh, generative model of how their observer observations are generated. Okay, next one. So I find this picture in the Active Inference book by Pizzullo on, and Thomas Parr and Carl um, very, very uh, interesting and useful to precisely uh, convey the point I want to make about the generative model that I feel that sometimes um, we just don't, um, don't see exactly um, how it uh, really works or, or its, its role is. So the generative model um, may be optimized as a new experience is acquired. So think about that slide that I had of how does a system, how, how would we determine what would be the preferred states to a system, right? So it's precisely through a generative model that allows us to optimize um, a, a model as new experience or new knowledge is acquired. Right, so then we have, um, for example, this picture here, where you see the difference between generative model and a generative process. I think I have more things in this slide. Could you just, yeah, okay. So then we have this distinction that should be made between a generative model and a generative process. And why so? Well, because the generative model may or may not converge with the generative process. And that's sort of what I wanted to highlight now. Um, next slide. Yeah, so the organism, the organism's model includes a range of hypotheses about a hidden state, which doesn't do not necessarily include the true value of the hidden state of the generative process. The generative process is, as you see here in the picture, the generative process is the world, right? Is how things are in the world, right? And the generative model is how I think that things are. Right, so um, it includes the, the way that I think that things are in the world includes a range of hypotheses about the world. But those hypotheses do not necessarily include the true value of the world, of the generative process. Right, um, there's so much, many, much, other, yeah. So the models we use to explain our sensorium may include hidden states that do not exist in the outside world and vice versa, right? So. In short, what this means is that there does not necessarily need to be an isomorphic match between the generative process and the generative model, right? So that's the, the, the gist here. Next slide. 
So this is where action becomes extremely interesting and extremely relevant because action is what is in the middle between generative model and generative process, right? So that's where we get active inference um, and what I, at least I think uh, is the, the most interesting thing in active inference framework as opposed to other um, com competing um, explanations or frameworks. So because action is generated on the basis of the inferences made under a generative model, right? But we just said that the generative model does not necessarily include the true state of affairs of the generative process. But notably, action is generated on the basis of the inferences made under a generative model. Next, yeah. So action is part of the generative process in the sense of uh, it is, it is through action that we make changes in the world. So action is really that interesting thing that is between the generative model and the generative process. Action is generated under the generative model, which does not necessarily match isomorphically with the generative process. And yet action is what is influencing the generative process. Action is what is influencing the world. Okay. So the, the, the interesting point here is that despite action being selected from uh, the inferences drawn under a model that is not necessarily accurate as we said, it is, it is this action that is going to affect the generative process. Okay, next one. So action can be formulated as the minimization of the discrepancy between the generative model and the generative process. So it is not only that thing that is sitting in the middle between generative model and generative process, but it is actually what um, can be used and is used to uh, minimize the discrepancy between generative model and generative process. Uh, next one. So this is this were the points that I uh, wanted to make on the FEP. And now I want to get us back to think about the FEP and the realism debate and see whether there are some uh, interesting points or things to consider and think about. Next slide. Okay, so let's think about the free energy principle under the realism debate, and let's think about the free energy principle under the option one of realism, where the idea was, um, so, so, so to say, in the definition, was that models are accurate representations. Okay. So if we think about um, the FUP and the realism debate of the first option, then we would have to say that generative models are inaccurate representations because they do not necessarily hold accuracy about uh, the generative process. So we could say that, okay, so then the generative models uh, constructed under the, the FEP, they are realistic representations with uh, some kind of form of minimal form of realism, some minimal form of structuralism and similarity. We could say, well, they are generative models, are representations of generative processes, they're just not accurate. They're inaccurate representations and they work. So that could be one way um, to do that. And this is sort of what I think that um, Kirchhoff, Kiverstein and Robertson uh, uh, think in their paper, but I would be also keen to hear their thoughts about that. Next. Yeah, so the reason that I say that is because once uh, we look at their paper in the literalist fallacy and the FEP model building, scientific realism and instrumentalism, um, so we saw before in one of the slides when I was presenting a realism debate that uh, one way of defining uh, realism is that the mappings within the model, oops, sorry, no, back, yeah, the mappings within the model and the target allow to convert truths found in the model into claims about the target system. So in this case would be the mappings between the FEP model allow to convert truths found in the FEP model into claims about the target system, which be an adaptive system. And then we find this, for example, no, sorry, let me just, yeah, <laughs> thank you. And then we find, for example, this passage in the paper, similarity we have argued for above between the properties of the generative model and adaptive behavior, such that one can capture real statistical relations in the world, which is the generative process, as we just said, by means of generative modeling. So it seems that in their paper, that's precisely where they, they're situated in the literature, which is precisely on the first claim by, by realism, where there is a similarity between the generative model and the generative process. 
But as we saw just now, the generative model does not necessarily need to be accurate about the generative process. Next one. Yeah, which is precisely what I was saying. An organism's uh, model includes a range of hypotheses about a hidden state, which do not necessarily include the truth value or the true value of the hidden state of the generative process. There is not necessarily uh, an isomorphic match of the model, of the generative model and the generative process or of the organisms and uh, the world, right? Okay, next. So then the second option would be the anti-realist um, option. So what we said about, generally speaking, we looked at three different ways, but what we said was that generative models are empirically adequate. So we talked about, oh, they're viable models um, and uh, not really true models about um, a scientific uh, phenomenon of interest. They are empirically adequate to the extent and if they um, allow us to learn more about the target system and if they allow us to make predictions about the target system then they are quite viable they're quite okay so that's the anti-realist um, view and in the case of this uh, anti-realist view then representation or matching accuracy is not uh, an issue because models represent in the way that they are used or we use them to form or generate understanding about a target system. Next. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So this anti-realism would be, um, this anti-realism about um, FEP would be very much in line with, uh, for example, this brilliant work by Albert Einstein on mathematics and geometry, geometry and experience. That would be perfectly aligned because um, what what he says there is that well models um, are empirically adequate, and this is more or less uh, and models will be more or less adequate and um, this is important to define what we mean by adequacy right that's the next question there will be more more or less adequate depending not on accuracy so not on how much the generative model matches the generative process so not on accuracy but on whether or not it minimizes free energy. So it is in the sense of whether or not the model is being used allows the minimization of free energy and much less on whether the model being used matches the reality. So that's a, a little bit of a twist there. Um, next slide. So then, then this non-realist FEP uh, would also be uh, very much in line with, for example, um, complex and dynamical systems theory, because um, as we know, it is organisms as complex systems that persist by seemingly to defy the second law. So of course, they don't really literally defy the second law of thermodynamics, but they seem to defy that law of thermodynamics that uh, dictates or prescribes that they should tend to dissipation or chaos. But as we observe behavior in the wild and in the world, we see that um, well, living organisms, adaptive systems, they don't do that. They don't persist to, or they don't succumb to the second law, right? So they are extremely complex and dynamic in the sense that the, their behavior is quite adaptive and that's what makes them so interesting. So in this sense, if um, our FVP models are um, virtuous, not by virtue of them being accurate in the sense that they literally match isomorphically with um, generative process, but by virtue of whether or not the model allows the system to minimize free energy, then they'll be very much in line with the complex systems theory. It would also be, I believe, uh, in line with an activism uh, theory, which I'm not sure if everyone um, in the room is acquainted with, but um, it's without, there's been some some attempts to make these links between the FEP and an activism and um, I think that given other work that I've done um, in the past um, I think that the only viable way of really making this bridge um, um, logically sound is through a non-realist FEP. Uh, a realist FEP uh, is, is much more harder to argue for um, uh, in their bridge or connection with inactivism. So by the, by, by, I'm sure that more most of us are acquainted with it. Um, inactivism states that uh, 
living beings enact the world to adjust and adapt biologically, cognitively, and culturally um, to the world. Okay, um, next slide. Yeah, so then this is uh, very much um, it. We've, we've covered now the three points I wanted to talk about. Uh, next slide. And I just want to conclude by, by sort of like laying out what the options are for us in this particular uh, debate that has become very lively debate in the last one year or so. So when we start from the high road, and this is important to convey, so it's not starting from the low road, it's starting from the high road. So when we start from the high road to the FEP, so when we start from the observation of how biological systems, adaptive systems behave, um, and then we have uh, two uh, philosophy of science options, which is how do we model these systems and how to think the models by which we explain living adaptive behavior. Okay, so we can take the realist take on it on our models and say, well, um, there is realistic representations. Our models literally match um, isomorphically uh, by different uh, philosophical strategies or arguments, they literally match uh, the behavior that we observe. And by the same reasoning, we can also say that the organisms behaving in the wild, they also behave and adapt by virtue of possessing models that literally match the world around them. So that's one option. The other option is the anti-realist option, which is to say that um, the models that we as scientists have, the FEP models, as well as the models that we as uh, living beings have, um, they allow us to uh, interact with the environment, understand the environment, because they are empirically adequate, not because they uh, accurately represent uh, the generative process. So these are the two options uh, that I just wanted to highlight today. I think this is my last slide. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much uh, for your time. And uh, of course, I'm very much uh, keen to hear your, all your thoughts and, and, and questions.